All right, peeps, on today's episode of The Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from the Patreons. Lots of gems, lots of Viking samurais in tights, lots of, oh, you're a historian? Do you have the documents to support that hypothesis? Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. Watch out. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? See, fool. All gravy. How are you? Doing good, man. It's good to see you. Wonderful. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So, uh, I had a great birthday celebration last week, yeah. thanks to you. Yeah, you, you up in the UF to the season. UF to the C. So, we, uh, as is kind of... I guess our new tradition or custom. Okay. Every birthday, you get me a new KFG yeah, shirt. Yeah, we're trying to keep it keep it alive, right? Yeah. So everyone knows that you know the KFG logo with the sidekick and yeah. the beard silhouette. Yeah. Uh, every year since we started this podcast, you've gotten me a t-shirt in a same it's t-shirt the in a different series, colors, but yeah, even though we're in like the third season. Well, somehow. I think you gave me the first one shortly before we started the podcast, ah. right? And uh, yeah, sense. so because uh, I already had the Kung Fu Genius nickname before this podcast, Got contrary it. to popular belief. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> right, yeah, right. and uh, it was great because my good friend uh, Dr. Kenneth J, who's yeah. uh, you know the dude looks like Thor, built like Thor. Uh, he's a he is uh, Thor. he's a strength and conditioning coach for a uh, number of UFC fighters, and he coached uh, and you know did the strength and conditioning for Nicholas Dalby. He also does the weight cuts. He's one of the best guys yeah. for weight cutting, and uh, he did that. In I Brazil. can I can use that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nick had a great fight, and then he came up here to uh, handle the weight cut for Mark Madsen. It's like mm-hmm. Olympic. Uh, uh, Greco-Roman silver medalist, and the crazy thing was, Kenneth got me tickets to go to nice. that UFC, which was right here at Madison Square Garden. It was Man. wild. Man. Uh, I'd been to UFC before, I'd been to Bellator before, but this was the first time I was at a big, like, numbered card. You know who was of, like, the a most night? jealous? Who? That guy. Oh yeah, why is that? <laughs> he was so jealous. Why he was why jealous because he couldn't come to UFC? <laughs> I wanted to go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was yeah. just the poorest excuse to try and do whatever weird Harry Potter esque <laughs> dick fan dyke bullshit <laughs> that you felt. felt yeah, I, I just want to know have you been working on that all week? Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, I feel like I feel like you've been trying to. Working on you, it for no, you years. You know what it is? Because the audience won't know this, but shortly before we started recording, Mikey Dean, our beloved sound yeah. engineer <clears throat> and uh, rising diva, uh, was <laughs> burning Dre constantly. Not and really. I'm, uh, I'm, he was okay. chapping Dre's ass right to the moment we go, okay, time to record. I'm a little unfazed, though. Yeah, and, yeah, and right. that, w- that was his chance to uh, to get you back. Get, so anyway, the UFC was a lot of fun. Uh, it was cool to see yeah. like a big card at Madison Square Garden. Originally, John Jones was going to fight uh, Steve yeah, Miocic uh, for the heavyweight, but John Jones had an injury. Aye, aye. Um, but no, it was great. It was it was it was a lot of fun, and uh, it was yeah, just like great energy to that be there. That last I had, fight was something, though. I had the uh, Kung Fu. Ge- I had the yeah. UFC Championship jacket that said yeah. Kung Fu Genius on the back, like because uh, my student Fire. Nicole Daniels, I think like two birthdays ago, got me yeah. that Venom. She knew you were gonna jacket. be going. Yeah, she knew yeah. it was gonna. It was crazy as I was wearing that. You know, it says Kung Fu Genius uh-huh. on the back, walking around there, uh, and <laughs> so many people were like, "Yo, where'd you get that?" Yeah. Because they thought, you know, because they sell a lot of UFC stuff during mm. the fights. It's like, you know, you want a T-shirt, and it's like 70 bucks for a T-shirt. Right. And so everyone thought I had just gotten it there, but it was it was like custom. So shout out to uh, to Nicole for getting yeah. that to me. That was a lot of fun. Nubian Ninja. And yeah, and it was just cool to, uh, it was cool to be there. It was re- really a lot of fun. And the highlight of that day after UFC was the fact that uh, Mark Madsen, the UFC fighter, came here with his coach, Firas Zahabi. Yeah. And they did their warm up here at City Wing Chun, which was amazing, right? That Imagine was like fun. Fira Sahabi for you know for our audience, they may not be totally, uh, you know, cued in on all the uh, MMA and UFC stuff. But Fira Sahabi is the was the coach for uh, George St. Pierre, and he's considered ESP. I, I suppose e- ESP, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I suppose he, he was, fought like he, he had ESP. Though. Yes, yes. Uh, I suppose Firas is one of the most. Um, Ye, one of the most well-respected uh, MMA coaches, and it oh, was yeah. really cool to see them in here 
because they, you know, the Firas did some grappling with Mark, and then he did, he put on your gloves. He actually put on. He needed a pair of boxing wow. gloves. And he just grabbed yeah. your gloves. Right? Just randomly, yeah, yeah. And we get these, and then did some sparring, some very light sparring. The day it was interesting to see what they do the day of. They call mm. it a shakeout, uh-huh. which is where you just want to make sure that your fighter is warm. Your fighter's not sitting around doing nothing, but right. you don't want to do anything to run the risk of an injury or or to do anything, uh, you know, too intense. So they did like kind of a soft grappling, you know. Um, training and kind of going over different transitions and details and they did some stand-up sparring and then he hit some mitts with his uh striking coach and then they just did some game plan stuff yeah. and so it was really cool was to dope. to see fear us at, at work and he was yeah. super nice we all took photos at the end he was very cool he, he even went up to my wooden dummy and started banging away on it and i was like man I, I wish I had a video like, yo, fear uh-huh. us the hobby, banging yeah. away on a wooden dummy, man. Love How killer it. would love that be, it. right? Love it. So that was uh, that was really a lot of fun. And, and earlier that day before I went to UFC, we all went to Hot Pot across the street for the first time. That was man. really cool. So, yeah. That was, and yeah th- we, thanks we, for, we, th- we ate all the food. We ate all the hot pots. Yeah. <laughs> all the yeah. hot pots. So, the, yeah, there's a hot pot joint that opened up right across the street from City Wing Chun. Yeah. And it is fire. Very professional. Very modern. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah, so that was cool. Thank you for being part of my birthday. Thank you, Mikey, for being part of my That's birthday. What's up. That's Appreciate what's up. you guys. Still I celebrating. Just turned twenty one. Yeah, right? man. So yeah, I can go in for the, now. For it's the twenty first time. For the twenty first time. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe more now at this point. Uh, yeah. So um, before we get started, just want to remind everyone that the best way to support the Kung Fu Genius is on Patreon. Patreon.com slash The Kung Fu Genius for all your Kung Fu Genius podcast needs. So if you support us for as little as $5, and what's $5 these days? Uh, it's not much, I'll tell you that much. Uh, it's barely coffee these days. You can get access to episodes early as well as all sorts of other goodies, my subscriber reels, uh, translations of Yip Man interviews, all sorts of stuff like that. And for higher tiers of support, you get all sorts of extra goodies and including uh, one of the higher tiers, of the, the baller tier, you get a private KFG episode would be. I've done a couple of those. So there are a couple of people out there that have like a private yeah. KFG interview with me, oh, uh, which is uh, which is always a lot of fun because then we don't have to worry about it being good. <laughs> <laughs> we could just be like, hey, let's just talk. <laughs> let's right, do it's it. cool. I've had some interesting right. conversations of course. with some of our Patreons. Of really, course. really cool stuff. Patreons are interesting people. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think we get our best questions from Patreon, which yeah. is why I want to you know take the questions exclusively from our Patreons. Nice. Like, we will today. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, the link for that is below, patreon.com slash the Kung Fu Genius. Go ahead and support us. Uh, so, before we even get started into our regular topic, I have a little bit of a shout out. What's the shout out? Um, well, uh, it's actually uh, about a, another podcast. Okay. Um, but it's not a podcast like the Kung Fu Genius podcast, where we talk about. All topical things in Chinese martial arts and bruises. All the latest news on okay. stuff that's 50 years old uh-huh. or, or older. Um, this is actually a scripted podcast. So it is a, I suppose you could say it's like a mini series or a story mm-hmm. told over multiple episodes. So um, it's a podcast in format. What is this about? Uh, so I'm going to tell you about okay. it. Um, Break it so down. it is called The Five Deadly Rebels, a Kung Fu sci-fi scripted podcast. Uh-huh. And uh, it's basically a modern day retelling of the Shaw Brothers' Five Deadly Venoms. Okay. Uh, except it's uh, it takes place uh, here in New York. The and Five of, Deadly Burrows. Yeah, instead of five masked, like, masters, it's like... Um, they're masters of different martial arts styles. So mm-hmm. I'm going to read it off here to make sure I don't get anything all right, all right. Uh, incorrect. Interesting. Uh, but there's uh, judo, kendo, muay thai, karate, and kung fu. Uh-huh. And all of these like masters, they're vying for like some big score in the criminal underworld of New York City. You know something about the criminal underworld of New York I City, I know right? nothing about this underworld. I uh-huh. couldn't even tell you how to get there. <laughs> How to get to the underworld. Excuse, that's such a tourist question. Excuse me. Can you tell me how to get to the underworld? Yeah, it's just go to Times right, Square. It's right, right there. Right there. Um, yeah, so, um, but what's also cool about this is that the soundtrack of this podcast yeah. story, this saga, is uh, from the Wu-Tang Clan producer. Oh. Well, you, gotta, you, you probably know how to say this better than me. Who, check that. Who is that? Oh. <laughs> so silver rings, silver rings, silver rings. Yeah. Okay, I was gonna say kill average. <laughs> silver kill rings. rings, silver rings. All right, killer rings. Uh, it's silver the, rings. The, yes. The host is his name's Ian. He's uh-huh. also one of our Patreon supporters, by the way. Right. Ian Tuason. 
Uh, and uh, so he he actually reached out to me to narrate a character in, in the podcast. Fire. So uh, the uh, the par- the character is known as the master. All right. Mm. Um, and I teach the five pupils uh, for reasons yet to be discovered. Um, and uh, the narrated fight scenes with the Kung Fu Master character describe the different animal styles of Kung Fu pretty accurately. And it's worth checking out if you're a fan of Kung Fu. So That's I'm going right. to I'm going to do my first narrative podcast recording. Well, super, it's super interesting you say this because uh, we we uh, we actually hanging out with Raekwon the other day, me and Mikey. Oh, yeah. And that's we, crazy. We, 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 super cool. Yeah. Typical day at, at, at my job now. Wow. Yeah, wow. Typical well, you day. know what's weird is that you sent me a text that like Raekwon was at your place. I told you that and he was. That was on Monday yeah. night, right? Yeah. And I just, at that point when the cl- we were doing some sparring at the end of class and I just put in Wu-Tang. <laughs> All right, right, for, right for as the I students said the to do the sparring, and as soon as the Wu Tang started playing, I get a text from you, yeah. and you're like, "Yo, Raekwon's at my place." I'm like, "Ah, this <laughs> can't so be random. real, man." It's so uh, random. So anyway, like, if you guys are into like kung fu, kung fu stories, which I assume a fair amount of our podcast listeners are, yeah. uh, check that out. I'm gonna put links to that podcast in the uh, description, Word. and you'll hear my silky smooth voice Ooh. on an upcoming episode. So super, super excited the about KFG that. Audio chocolate. Oh, okay. audio chocolate. Yeah, I know we. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, we should not tell Ian about uh, about our other students that have way better voices than me and do this stuff for a living, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, we got a br- we got a brief yeah. we got like radio voice guys What's in here. What's up, yeah. man? What's up, baby? I've always been told that I have a, a face for radio right. and a voice for television. You do. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I've got so- a face that launched the files and ships. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey everyone, just want to let you know Wing Chun Illustrated is now offering a paperback edition through Amazon, reaching a larger global market. And no, they're not ditching the glossy magazine edition through MagCloud. You can now simply choose the version of this magazine you prefer and the one with the cheapest shipping wherever you live. Order your copy of Wing Chun Illustrated today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping for Prime members. Go and check that out. So I have uh, an idea of something to talk about today. I actually got a great question again from Sifu Topher, one of our good friends. Yeah, and also one shout our, out to Sifu Topher. Yo, what's going on out there? I know. Oh, you, you know mentioned Sifu Topher and then the police turn up. Yeah, yeah, you know what it is. That's the underworld Someone's out there. the criminal underworld, I was going to say. <laughs> All right, someone went to Times Man. Square. Right. It's this one yeah. elevator in Times Square, yes. if you know. Yeah. It's the one that Tupac went up and then got shot. If you oh, just go down, man. you go to the underworld. That's, yeah. If, when you if know, you go you up, know. you get shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that's how it is. Uh, I so know when, exactly where that building is, Yeah, too. I'm sure you do. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you do. It's so you're, wild. Uh, you're the man who knows where all the bodies are hidden. I've been thousands of times. I don't know where the criminal underworld is, but I know where the Camden underworld is. Oh, God. I don't know, man. Please don't tell us. So anyway, uh, Sifu Topher has got a great question for us, as always. In fact, uh, a few episodes ago, we did, a, uh, we did an episode based on one of his questions, the episode about uh, ranks. Uh, and, oh, yeah. And that's up. He has his own podcast, by the way, that other Wing Chun guy. That's uh, I don't recall us talking about Shabba ranks. <laughs> no. So here we go. We wouldn't... We wouldn't. <laughs> So We're be- not but, a reggae podcast. But before uh, before we get into that question, I got to talk about something that's been going on IG lately. Well, well lately at the time of this recording, maybe IG? by the time this episode comes out, it's yeah. old schnooze by that point. What? What's uh, this? So my boy Viking Samurai oh, yo. wants to fight. Oh, yo. Uh, well... You told me about this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let, me, let me just backtrack yeah. uh, uh, a little bit because if, if people are not on... Instagram, you might not know about this kind of brouhaha, right? So, um, Viking, Wait, Viking, yes. Is, is, is the guy that he wants to fight one of our Patreon supporters? No, no, okay. no. We, let, me, let me set the stage here okay, so that the audience gets caught up because we cannot assume that they know what's going on. Okay. So, as you know, one of the things that people are doing nowadays, especially <laughs> YouTubers, calling them out, YouTubers are trying to get fights with professional fighters. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We got our Logan, what's his face or whatever was perhaps the Logan first Paul. one to do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. except that he's like a really he's, good boxer. He's actually pretty yeah, good. He's actually pretty good. I wish I didn't say he's a really yeah. good. But he's very powerful. He's yeah. he's young. He trains. He takes it very seriously. He's he got almost, lots of he almost did Furies. Yeah, he, yeah, he takes he lots almost of ste- Furies ass. He takes lots of steroids. Right? Yeah. So um, so there's this like kind of new thing where like you could basically just be a YouTuber or 
you know, an average Joe or a slightly above average Joe who's not famous. And then, you know, if you talk enough shit, <laughs> you'll you'll piss off one of these guys and convince them to fight you for yeah. some bucks. Right. So uh, Vikings- similar to what Dreisen tried to do. <clears throat> what? You're not bringing him back. We're not bringing, We're back, not bringing him back. So I never brought him back. We, first of all, we started taking questions only from Patreons, mainly to not let Tryson get in. Because <laughs> yeah. that broke motherfucker won't even won't even yeah. support us yeah. for five dollars a he's, month. He's not on Patreon. Oh, no matter how Patreon. much you keep saying that he is, <laughs> yeah. he's not there. Yeah, 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 I could have yeah. sworn he was a supporter. No, 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 no. He is no, no, no. on a low. I think he's, he's a, a tractor. He's a hater. I think he's. I think he's on a low. He's a hater under a different name. So, uh, so anyway, uh, Viking Samurai, he's a, uh, he's a YouTuber. Yeah. Uh, I've been on his show before. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, like, he's big into, like, Van Damme and stuff like that. All right? Mm-hmm. And uh, he's a, uh, you know, he's a good-looking dude. He's in shape. He likes bodybuilding. He's a natural bodybuilder. Yeah, no he's, sauce. He's, he's a natty. No steroids. He's natty. He's a natty. All okay. right? Yeah. The only thing unnatural about him is his good looks, all right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah. and, and, and he, you know, he likes the high kicks and the splits and the jump kicks. Mm-hmm. And he's very much on that kind of Van Damme tip, right? Got it. And his channel's interesting. I mean, I found out about Viking Samurai by watching his channel. He had, uh, you know, lots of uh, episodes about blood sport. And he even had, like, uh, you know, uh, Sheldon Ledich, who was, like, the writer of blood sport on there. He had Frank Dukes did on he, there. Did, does he know that you met Van Damme at one point? I did. Well, here's the funny thing. He's a huge, like, Van Damme fanboy, uh-huh. all right? And uh, our um, meeting with Van Damme probably yeah. didn't put Van Damme in the best light um, because, you know, for longtime fans of the podcast, you know the story. Dre and I bumped into Jean-Claude Van Damme in Hong Kong back uh-huh. in 2018. Yeah. And I would say he was on one of all the drugs, okay? Maybe, I, maybe two. I couldn't tell you what he was on. I would just say maybe he's on a little bit of everything right yeah, now because uh, he, was he was out of his mind. Cool. I don't okay? think he was on any drugs. I just think he was on the uh, he was he was in an argument. No, no, no. But I was, was the in, one that looked into his in, cold eyes, black <laughs> eyes, like doll's he, eyes. He was in a moment with so, someone. No, I mean, you know, we saw him there. Yeah. Antonio saw him, right? Yeah. Arnell was, like, was there, too. Yeah, and I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. There's Jean Claude Van Damme. He's in front of the restaurant Ar- we're about to go Ar- eat at. Antonio right? sh- pointed him he out. He was on the point him out, yeah, right? Yeah. And I'm the one, of course, yeah. I'm the KFG. <laughs> I got to go up there and say something to him, <laughs> right. right? So I go up behind him. And the weird thing is, like, I'm not a big dude. But when I went up behind him, I looked at him and he's like, he's not a big dude either. And, you know, since I saw him as a kid, you know, you just yeah. imagine, like, the muscles and uh-huh. everything, like, like he's like an imposing figure and he was yeah. like not that much taller than me and uh-huh. he wasn't like really that big and if you didn't know he was Jean-Claude Van Damme you probably wouldn't have even looked twice at him right okay. mind you he's older now he's not necessarily as sauced up as he used to be mm-hmm. although I'm pretty sure he's still taking some sauce I mean, um, but I anyway I thought he was a natty I, daddy my ass right <laughs> um well, I don't know. Maybe if you tell Viking Samurai yeah. that Jean-Claude Van Damme was not natty, he'll get upset or yeah. whatever. I think he's got a little bit of an emotional investment in that okay. stuff. Okay. Where it's like, I mean, Van Damme is an actor. Who gives a it's shit okay. if it's gives okay. a shit if you think I'm not steroids. a natty. Yeah, but I mean, what? <laughs> what? what? Yeah. What's not natural took, about you? I took You're, steroids for this elbow shit. Oh, I had like uh, elbow corticosteroids injury. are yeah, not anabolic not, steroids. Come on. So. Yes, yes. We, we, I that know makes that, me not I know natty. that Tom Bleeker wrote a whole book about Bruce Lee taking steroids when he didn't seem to realize that corticosteroids are anti-inflammatories. Still. Corticosteroids and anabolic steroids, not right. the same thing. All right, everyone has taken hey. anti inflammatory In that case, then I've also juiced up to yeah. the tits after steroids my are steroids, at, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. after surgeries or whatever. No, no, right? no, no, that's like me having a full English breakfast and telling everyone that I do mushrooms regularly. <laughs> wow, wow. I'm just saying, <laughs> both of those could be true. Roids are roids. I mean, they man. are. But the point <laughs> is, is that I know the difference between breakfast yes. mushrooms and magic exactly, mushrooms. Exactly, exactly. But every time we go, like, Tom Bleeker said Bruce Lee took steroids. Uh, cord- cortisone? <laughs> cord- corticosteroids? Anabolic? Really? I'll okay. tell you, when I was you, taking them things, I yeah. felt great. Yeah, you were jacked. Uh, I was jacked. jacking. Yeah. Jacking so anyway, the mushrooms you were so taking at the same anyway, time. So anyway, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stay. Out. Yo, you got to get those keys ready and start dangling them oh, in front of Dre. No. All right, no. we got to keep Dre Don't OT on topic as oh, much as possible. No. Right? Don't do it. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right. So, uh, anyway, um, 
Yeah, and we I tap Van Dam and I said yeah. the words that never came out of my mouth before. Excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Van Dam. And I remember saying that I was thinking like, I've never said those words in that order in my entire life. In my at that point, my forty some odd years right. of life, I'd never said those in that order. Damn. So, uh, and he turned around and he. He was high as a kite, man. I mean, let's be... He, I don't know what he was on, man, but he was on some major, major shit. He's on right? some new shit. Whatever he was on, that's what you want to be on when you're about to die. Yeah, all some right? shit so they like, only have in Hong you don't Kong. Even, you don't even know what planet you're on, okay? You're dying <laughs> yeah. in, your, in your late 90s. You want to be yeah. on whatever the hell whatever. Van Damme was yeah, on that I'm day, on what right? he's having. And, uh, and, you know, and he was like, uh, maybe <laughs> later. And then we didn't yeah. get our, you know, f- cool fan of the day. Right. Because he's notoriously fan friendly. And that's why I knew that from his IG. I'm like, mm. oh, cool. Maybe he'll take a photo with us. It'll be great yeah. uh, for, you know, Kung Fu Genius social media or whatever. And he was like, maybe later. And he was having an argument with some woman unknown, right? So yeah, I'm uh, sure it was like innocent argument, <clears throat> you know. I don't know. Things happen. He so probably anyway, stepped on her toe or something. So I was on Viking Samurai's show. Yeah. And uh, I was like, yeah, I was like, and, and he's a huge Van Damme fanboy. And I'm like, oh, do you know that I met Van Damme? And he was like, yeah, I think I vaguely recall you posting something. But I think that he, he doesn't want to hear stuff like that, right? So I, I, I tried uh-huh. in a very sideways way to tell the story on his podcast. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I tapped him and he right. might have been on all the songs. Or maybe, yeah. maybe I said he was just drunk or something, mm-hmm. right? But no, no, he was, he was high as fuck, man. Yeah, man. Seriously. Um, so anyway, uh, Not wrong with that. Viking Samurai is a huge Van Damme fan, and he's also had a series of interviews with Frank Dukes where he was trying. You know, because Frank Dukes is a notorious bullshit artist. I, like um, Frank Dukes is a Van Damme fan too. No, he's not. No, he's not. The two of them, they, they, he sued him. And I could have sworn he they, was. No, they were back in the day, but they they had a very acrimonious split over the mm. the movie The Quest. Oh, um, yeah. No, they're not they're not homies anymore. Ah, damn. Um, but but anyway. Um, Viking Samurai, uh, his real name is David. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like an '80s American martial arts action movie fan to like mm-hmm. a fault, like like to a fault, right? Like it's like it's all Van Dam, it's all you know, all that old school stuff, right? Yeah. And hey, I grew up during that time period. I love it, but I also grew up and got into other stuff too. And I can appreciate like Bloodsport, which yeah. I think is a great movie, and. Also understand that it's it's campy and corny and it's of its time. And when I was a kid, I thought Bloodsport was the craziest, best movie in the world. Yeah. Because, like, the whole aesthetic in Hong Kong and the fight, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then you grow up and you're like, this is so cheesy, but there's still something about it that, Some, that's entered. Like, it, I'll yeah. st- I still watch Bloodsport, like, twice a year. If it's on that TV, I'm watching it. I, I'm, I, I keep the my, channel. My thing is I introduce Bloodsport to people who haven't seen it, uh-huh. and I give them the live commentary from the KFG like right. oh this is so and so uh this is the history of the Kowloon walled city uh Ooh. this this chase scene doesn't make any sense because Van Damme first got gets chased by uh, yeah. Forrest Whitaker and the other dude and he's crossing <laughs> Nathan Road on the Kowloon side and he ends up somehow on the Hong Kong Island side oh yeah on a jetty over there and it's how, like how yeah yeah, well, yeah how, <laughs> how did that run right? right it's also like when you see men in black the first men in black um before Will Smith was married to Jada oh, oh so dang. was that in the movie the J- oh no no that's real life sorry. Damn. Um, uh, he's yeah, I don't know if you remember the first Men in Black. It starts and he, you know he's a cop right. Yeah. And he's chasing some dude which at the time he doesn't know is an alien. And and they're running. Chasing and the my fir- man who played Darth Maul. Oh was that was that Ray I Park? Think so yeah. no it was not Ray Park. It, it was. was just some dude. It was nah. just some dude. All right. No, yeah. He's a make- Dre Fax. He was yeah. Dre right? Fax. He was Tony Fax. He's your mate. First him. of all, it was not Ray Park. I know it was. It was literally not Ray Park. I'm Ray, telling you. Ray I'm Park. Telling you. And everyone right now is watching this, Let me tell googling you. it. And He's then in the movie see- though. But the, but the, oh, he okay. Just, so he he just, that, yeah. That's called chain, moving the goalposts. Yeah, moving the goalposts. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> No, right. well, I'm he's in the movie though. Yeah, he's in the movie in the, okay, right? so might, he's not that character, but like he's yeah, in the movie, he's so I'm still right. He might be confused with Ray Parker Jr., isn't he? No, the guy no. saying no. Ghostbusters. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, no. 
I was so not anyway, confused. you know, if you see the opening scene, like Will Smith is chasing that dude and he's around Times Square. Yeah. And when he finally catches up to him, he's like on Central Park West. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> right. I live in New York. Yeah. That's yeah, a long do some serious run, running. Sir. Yeah. yeah. Now there's yeah. a there's a film called Premium Rush that starred Joseph Gordon yes. Levitt. Right? Uh, they they shot it right here out in front of City Wing. Well, they shot it mostly up where I was living on Riverside Drive around uh-huh. like that. And there's yes. this right at the beginning when he first runs away from Michael Shannon, right? He's riding down Broadway like a 112th and he's going past <laughs> there that gets to 105th and then the next shot he's riding down Broadway from 138th down to 125th yeah oh, and wow. it's like I'm like you see yeah. this is I live here so I already know that this is <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> then I remember no they actually shot a whole scene right here on 6th Avenue because all mm-hmm. my female students were looking at Joseph Gordon Levitt <laughs> and they were like oh he's so dreamy and I crossed the street and he walked the other way and I looked at him and yeah. like and it was oh Dreaming. You're like, oh right, they're correct. He is dreaming. Yeah, he, <laughs> but yeah, to, 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 to be, yeah, he was pretty dreamy. All right, so I was like, oh, okay, I get, okay, I get it, I get it, right, right, right. right. So uh, um, yeah, and and also. Not, not to harp on this topic, Jesus Christ, the Kung Fu genius. We haven't talked about anything Kung Fu related. <laughs> you know the movie Say Anything, shot in Seattle. Yes. And there's a scene where he's in the car after he kind of breaks up with Ioni Sky or whatever, and he's like in one section of Seattle, and he turns around and he's like. Way on the other side of town. That stuff drives me nuts. What's the What's the oh, movie with Gordon good. Levitt and in, in, uh, Scarlett Johansson? That movie is fucking funny. That he played a okay, funny so character anyway, in that movie. Let's go. But yeah, oh, Joe right. Keys, he's getting he's getting me off topic. All yeah, right, he's, he's doing okay. well. Viking doing Samurai. Well. I feel bad because Viking Samurai. The moment he knows we're going to be talking about him, he's going to watch this, uh-huh. and he's like trying to listen to what we're saying about him. And we keep getting deep, and he's like, "Jesus Christ, stop talking about say anything and talk about me." All right. So, uh, so anyway, um, my bad. He, he late, lately, uh, I think maybe in an effort to make his YouTube channel bigger or his Instagram bigger, he's been like trying to get a fight with like a real dude. And he started calling out Michael Bisping, of all people, all right? Uh, retired yeah. former middleweight UFC champion, yeah. all right? Uh, who's got one eye and, and two fake knees now, right? Mm. Um, regardless, uh, a one-eyed, two artificial knee Michael Bisping, I think, would beat the brakes off Viking Samurai in the ring. Now, the, the funny thing is when I, when I say that, people get... The, uh, most people who understand fight sports, yeah. uh, they, they know that the Viking Samurai has no chance against a professional or former professional. Um, I mean, look, when it comes to boxing, everyone has a puncher's chance. Okay. okay. Anyone can go in there and land a shot and, it's been beat, done. and beat anyone. It's, it's happened a lot of times, right? It's been done. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's statistically probable. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that it's going to be the case. And there were a couple people, like, he's got a couple people who think he can do it. Rocky did it. And, uh, yeah, Rocky, a fictional character, yeah. right? But that's also my point. Like, Viking Samurai's also, like, kind of, in, I think he's trying to be an actor. Maybe he is an actor. And I think sometimes people confuse movie fighting and fairy tale endings with the real world, right? Doesn't matter how good your splits are. Oh, doesn't man. matter how good your jump spinning back kicks are, all right? When you are in the ring with boxing gloves against someone who has done it many, many times before, mm. someone who's been in the trenches, has that experience, oh, man. understands how to pace themselves over the course of however many rounds they're fighting. Controlling that knows adrenaline, their power, too. Knows, yeah, can control that adrenaline because mm. they've been there before when the crowd is cheering. Mm. And you're in there for the first time, mm. okay? That's got to be some real fairy tale shit for you to win. Now, I'm not saying... That Viking Samurai couldn't go in there and land a lucky punch on whatever person decides well, to go in the ring. Back with spinning, it. Ki- spinning lucky back, back kick. spinning kick yeah. in, 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 in boxing <laughs> right. and then get disqualified, right? Maybe that's what he's gonna do. He's gonna come out, he's gonna I, try one of I his think Van Damme kicks, plan. knock the guy out, and then get disqualified yeah. and then make it a controversy. That's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. As I've been, it avoids him getting his go. ass beat. All right. Although I don't know, I can imagine him trying to do a jump spinning back kick against Bisbing in a bar and just Bisbing just cracking him with a left hook. <laughs> in midair. All right. In midair. <laughs> no. Yes. All right. Oh, man. So, um, well, first of all, I think uh, Bisbing, from what I understand, I think Bisbing already blocked him because he kept like kind of trolling oh. him in the com. He kept trying to troll Bisbing, and I think Bisbing's already blocked him. Um, but I also think, I mean, Bisbing. That, that's not a big enough fight for Bisping. Is this right? a loud environment that we're in? Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, uh, 
Don't make no it, sense. I mean, the, that, that fight doesn't make any sense for Michael Bisping. Because, mm. Michael, first of all, Michael Bisping's retired. Yeah. He's dealing with some health things. But he's also much bigger than Viking Samurai. And that if, is true. Um, if he wanted to come back for I mean, some cut, kind of celebrity... Cut all that weight? Well, if he wanted to come back for some kind of celebrity boxing match, his sure mm. shit would not be against Viking Samurai. It would need to be against... A celebrity, yeah. all right. So someone that people know, right? Right, right. If you're not like really cued in into like the Jean Claude Van Damme, Sheldon Ledich, Frank Duke's world of YouTube, you have not heard of Viking <laughs> Samurai, right? Uh, and so for Michael Bisping to take a fight with him doesn't make any sense for Michael Bisping because the thing is, for a former professional fighter, they have everything to lose like yeah the thing is yeah if you're the upcoming youtuber that wants yeah. to get in there and fight a professional yeah if you got in there and got your ass kicked you still win because you got the press you got the if fight anything, maybe he, you got he should money. fight logan paul yeah uh yeah but see the thing is logan paul's not gonna fight logan paul wants to fight the former mma guy no, from boxing about guy. bisping should fight logan yeah paul. no no yeah that if would anything. be a much more suitable right. type fight right uh -huh. but not uh you know not viking samurai right no 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 diss to viking samurai because i've been on his show i think he's great i love his content but it's realistic and i know that in his mind because mm -hmm. he's an actor He's like, yeah, well, the odds are stacked against me. So I'm going to show them all that, yes, I will get a fight with one of those celebrities. <laughs> Not sure. Okay. Damn. Anyway, I don't think the Bisping thing is going to happen. And I think that that's good for Viking Samurai because uh, Viking Samurai also has a couple things, in my opinion, against him when it goes, goes to going in the ring and having a real boxing match. Okay. Uh, one. Okay. He's never boxed before. He's never been in that type of fighting environment. Two, he's really into bodybuilding, okay? And now he's kind of, tra he's training with a boxing coach. And okay. the boxing coach that he has is really great. But the problem is, it's just like when you learn Wing Chun. If I teach you a new move or a new defense, okay? Yeah. I just taught it to you, but that doesn't mean you can apply it at will. And sometimes from his postings, I have the feeling like, Okay, so you just had a boxing session or a sparring session with a really good coach. That doesn't mean you can do that <laughs> stuff yet freely against someone who's trying right. to murder your face <laughs> with boxing gloves. Right. Okay? No. Nah. There's there there's a huge cavernous gap doesn't happen between that way. the technical know-how, learning how to do something, learning step by step, doing it in mitts, doing it with your coach, and then being able to do it when the lights are on. When the adrenaline is pumping, mm -hmm. and you're in there with someone who's been there before, you gotta be right? A, a effective. Being so able to you know he, he'll this. post like, "Yeah, I just had a really good session or whatever." And in my mind, I'm thinking, "Cool, you're learning the stuff that everyone you're challenging learned 20 years ago and yeah. have been doing it for 20 years, and you just learned it." And I think there's a little bit of a Dunning Kruger effect in him not understanding that gap, because someone who's been in the ring before. It doesn't mean that they can't get knocked out or mm -hmm. that he, he can't land a lucky punch. But someone who's been in the ring before and fought before knows what it's like to get punched in the face and not uh, fall apart when it happens. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he lands a doof, and then they go there and they keep going. Right. But he gets that same punch, and it's the first time he feels yeah. his uh -huh. nose is bleeding a little bit. His nose is uh -huh. a little twisted. Psychologically, his eyes getting crazy. a little puffy, yeah. and he's never done that before. And suddenly he's thinking about that stuff. And mm -hmm. the other guy, if he got hit and got a black eye, would just keep fighting and not think about it. Yeah. He's now thinking about the swollen eye, the, bust, the busted lip, the yeah. busted nose, how his feet aren't moving the way he wants it to, and the guy's going to keep coming at him. The other guy knows mm. how to pace himself. The other guy knows how to deal with adversity, and he's going to be in there, and then he's going to realize, oh, shit, this is, this is where it comes, yeah. right? So the Bisping thing is not happening. So then um, my boy Nam Fan, yeah. who's a former UFC fighter, uh, he's 40 years old. He still trains every day. He's got Can a Can an Asian brother get some love? That's right. Yeah. Our boy Nam Fan yeah. MMA, right? At Nam Fan, uh, P-H-A-N-M-M-A. That's his famous right? quote, by the way. And uh, yeah, he's yeah. great. I love him. And, uh, and he's a fan of the podcast and he's said like really nice stuff about the podcast uh -huh. he's always like really encouraging to me and like you know he's like oh brother you're really great, great shape or whatever and it's a total honor yeah. for him for him to say that about me uh and he had this like very innocent post thing where he talked about nate diaz in, and calling out regular people to fight and uh, viking samurai i think he misunderstood the post 
and then got a little uppity, and then the two of them went at it, and now so the thing is that maybe Viking Samurai will fight Nam Fan in a boxing Whoa. match. And I and I had uh, Nam on my um, on the KFG Instagram. We did like a live. Yeah. And uh, maybe maybe they'll set up something for January. Now Nam gives up weight to uh, Viking Samurai. Uh, Viking Samurai is a little heavy, so he would have to come up in weight. Viking might have to lose a little bit of weight. But um, there is a cavernous gap in terms of uh, ex- skill and experience and mm-hmm. also the ability to keep a cool head under that pressure. Damn, I mean, it's, damn, it's one damn. thing to stand there and hit a bag. Um, it's another thing when the guys hit you a couple times and, and you hit him a couple times and he's not going down. Yeah. And then you're like, dude's not going down. He keeps coming at you. Um, I think that there's a part of me that I know that Viking Samurai is trolling a little bit because I think he knows that this is if he gets a fight like this, it'll be good for his channel Mm -hmm. because he'll get some exposure. Um, But I also think that there is a part of him that thinks that he can legitimately beat a, a professional or former professional or retired professional. Uh, in the ring just because he lifts weights and hits the bag a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was funny because Nam will text me every now and again, like when Viking posts something. It's like he'll have a boxing session and immediately afterwards he's doing bicep curls and weightlifting. Right. And it's like you do know that all the hypertrophy that you have from building up muscles, those muscles need fuel and oxygen when you start fighting. And they're going to be depleting and sucking on your cardio. I don't see him doing a, hell, a lot of cardio. Okay. And if I were Viking Samurai right now, I'd probably lay off on the bicep curls and like... No, start, you don't need them right now. Start running, yeah. start doing biking, use yeah. the Concept 2 rower, uh, do heavy, heavy bag rounds, lots of sparring, lots of technical training. Uh, the the he, do, he was doing chest flies. Doing all right? Nah, like, man. so... You, you know that you got to keep in that. boxing. You got to keep your elbows in. You want to protect yeah. yourself against those shots. Yeah, let's bloat our pecs <laughs> out a little bit more so we're incapable of bringing our elbows in. <laughs> oh, no. Sounds like that. So whoever's oh, yeah. training him needs to tell him to lay off the bodybuilding. Yeah, you ever see that, that anti-drug commercial from the 80s where the dad comes Say in no. with the pot? Oh, yeah, he yeah. He says, yeah. who I taught lo- you how to do this stuff? I learned about watching you. all right. Me. I learned about watching you. <laughs> who taught you to do Pe- chest flies <laughs> while training for a boxing match. <laughs> no one, all right. But just thought it was a good idea. It's not a good idea. Lay off the bodybuilding if you don't want to totally die in the ring. And I mean, gassing out all that bloated muscle mass needs fuel. Oh, That's man. fuel that you're not going to be able to use for like punching because it's just there to keep that stuff moving. So anyway, we will uh, keep up to date on this ongoing saga. If it happens sometime in the new year on a weekend where I'm free, I might consider flying out for the fight. Okay. Uh, that'd be a lot okay. of fun. So uh, anyway. I now, might be down uh, for that. Might se- be down for that. 37, 37 minutes in, let's get to some let's get to the question topics. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's see what we got here. I'm doing your job for you. Right, here. Right. I can read, I can read it off. <laughs> All right, here's our that. question from Sifu Topher. So if you're not local to NYC, one of the easiest ways for you to improve your Wing Chun training is to train online with me. Online private training is tailored toward the individual and geared towards serious practitioners who want to improve their skills or knowledge base. I offer two private lesson subscriptions, twice a month and four times a month. Kung Fu Genius listeners use the code KFG online to get one online consultation lesson free with the purchase of any subscription. That code and the links are in the description below. Online private training is a convenient way for you to ask any of the questions you've had about application, form, theory, or even how to teach. Bring a partner to train with you online at absolutely no extra cost. I'll show you how to train with your partner online. Again, use the code KFG online to get a free consultation lesson with the purchase of any online subscription links are in the description below and i'll see you online yo yo sifu tofa sifu tofa is asking Uh uh-huh if you had to distill your wt into a few sets what would they be Uh uh-huh so wow. a, gu- a gun is held to my head, and I'm only allowed to teach a streamlined version of Wing Chun for whatever reason. Oh, right? wow. Yeah, uh, also, which is oddly enough very similar to what Dr. Leung Jan did uh, um, in uh, the Gulo village. So, hmm. uh, of course, I'm not an expert in that uh, lineage. If you want to know all about that, you got to talk to our boy Jim Rosalando, among other people. 
Um, but from what I understand, uh, Dr. Leung Jian, uh, who is the Si Gong of Yip Man, all yeah. right, so the teacher of Yip Man's teacher, Chan Wa Sun. And uh, Leung Jian was known as like the, um, the Wing Chun Kun Si Wong, the king of Wing Chun, right? And hmm. you know he's he's a bit of a Wong Fei Hong character. You know he was a he was a doctor, a scholar, an ass kicker. You know this kind of proverbial Chinese gentleman who had fighting skills and was educated. You know this kind of archetype of what a Sifu is supposed to be. <laughs> and we had one in Wing Chun. His name was Doctor Leung Chan. Sort of like and my Seagong. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of examples of that. Uh-huh. Um, and then there's just like the salty guys who teach like us. <laughs> and. Uh, so supposedly, Dr. Leung Jan, when he retired, because he lived in Fatsan, the town that Yip Man grew up in, and a very famous town as far as Chinese Kung Fu is concerned. Wong Feng is also from Fatsan. Uh, when Leung Jan retired, he left Fatsan and went to a small village uh, in the countryside called Gulo Village. Gulo and Village. And he had, I believe, of course I could be wrong on the details, I believe he had a nephew named Wong Wa Sam. Mm-hmm. And uh, he taught his nephew a streamlined version of Wing Chun, uh, which didn't have what you would consider the modern structure of Wing Chun, like the three forms, the dummy, and let's say some weapons or something like that, right? Uh, now, of course, there's some people who claim that in the time of Leung Chan, uh, there was no Siunam Tao Cham Kyu Biu Ji set up with the wooden dummy. And that, that, because there's some people that are trying to say that. Yip Man was the one who did that kind of borrowing very liberally from Yun Kei San. Mm. And uh, I'll let the historians argue that, of which they're really none. Most of the people who claim to be historians are, in fact, not historians. They're just agenda pushers and people who are trying to sell whatever lineage they're selling right now. And, oh, it just so happens that this lineage that I'm selling you is the authentic one. All right. Okay. Isn't that a coincidence? Yeah. Right. So there are some people that believe that uh, Dr. Leung Jan never had Sunom Tao Cham Kyu Biu Ji as like a training program and then dummy and formalized chi sao or whatever. And they believe that because later when he went to, uh, uh, to Gulo Village, the streamlined version he taught uh, to his nephew did not have Sunom Tao Cham Kyu Biu Ji. He basically distilled it into like 12 short sets from what I understand. Again, I'm not an expert in that lineage, so mm-hmm. uh, apologies for any inaccuracies as far as that goes. Um, he distilled it into like 12 basic exercises that you do solo, you can do on the dummy, and you can do with a partner. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a very quick and simple set. I remember when I I uh, uh, had a training session with Jim Rosalando many, many years ago when I first met him. He was like, oh, I'll teach you like the, the Gulo Village Wing Chun. And then like, you know, I was there for like an hour and he showed me the sets and went on the dummy. And he's like, OK, that's it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's kind of funny because <laughs> wow. in, in our Wing Chun, like I, I could stand there and demonstrate the Siunam Tao, the Cham Kyu, the Biuji, the dummy, the pole and the knives. But I couldn't say, okay, that's it. Yeah. I can only say that's it in terms of like the formalized forms. But in terms of like the methods, okay, now we have single arm chi sao, poon sao, double arm chi sao, go sao, lat sao, all that kind of stuff. In terms of the practical fighting, we have sparring. And then we have footwork drills and partner drills and this, that, and the other thing. And wall bag and heavy bag and all this kind yeah. of stuff to improve this. And, and all these and everything in between, right? And self-defense and all that, right? It'd be, it'd be totally crazy if I could show someone the entire WT system in, in an session. hour. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could show someone how it works. I could give them examples. But like in, to, to go from like soup to nuts and show the whole thing, this is, you know, the style is simple. The style is straightforward. But there's a lot of curriculum to teach to get good at that simple style, right? So... Uh, so to a certain degree, you know, streamlining your Wing Chun is, is kind of what supposedly Leung Jan did when he retired and then spent his remaining years in the Gulo village teaching his nephew and taught him this more simplified version. There are some people that look at that simplified version, which doesn't have the forms, and then they use that to deduce that Leung Jan never had the forms and that that is the only version of uh, what Leung Jan taught. But mm-hmm. there's some problems with that hypothesis because there are other people in the Chan Wa Sun lineage outside of Yip Man who also has, have the Siun Tao Cham Kyu Biu Ji form structure. So, right. I mean, that's more of a question for the, uh, the so-called historians. But, uh, 
they're, they're really no Wing Chun historians. They're, they're, they're people who have an above average interest in history, but that doesn't mean that they're using historical method. That doesn't mean they're using Bayes' theorem to, to figure out probability in terms of what they claim is a fact that they could say, okay, this, you know, there, there's a lot of confirmation bias. There's a lot of, these aren't facts, these are opinions. There's mm. a lot of hearsay and interjection that gets sold as uh, um, pure fact. And the truth is, even if you go to China and do research, all you're doing is listening to what other Chinese guys are telling you. And they're telling you what they heard from their Sifu, which is rife with bias, confirmation bias, hearsay, um, fill in the blank facts or whatever. So it, you can't really make any authoritative claims about Wing Chun's history. That doesn't stop people from doing it. There are plenty of people out there like Sergio who have all these claims about what exactly happened. Dude doesn't even speak Cantonese. <laughs> or he doesn't read Chinese. And he makes very bold claims. Well, he was there. Uh, he must have been there. He yeah, must have a time to. machine, right? It seems and, like and he so, was But there. so the problem is you, you can't... You, you can look at different things and you could say, okay, this is what these people teach. This is what this lineage teaches. This is what they profess as the history. This is what they profess as the history. But that doesn't mean that anything they're saying is remotely true. There are really no written records. Even the stuff that supposedly came out from Hendrik Santo a number of years ago, oh, which yeah. I also believe, it's all bullshit. All right? It's all bullshit. And, and so... We need to think about, okay, we have Wing Chun now as it is, the various lineages, whatever. So what are we going to do with it now? We can take this and we can improve it for future generations, make it more relevant, include training against more modern styles, modern training methods, uh, and take this thing and improve it. Or we can argue about what we swear <laughs> happened in the 1850s. As if, even if you could have a perfect museum piece of Wing Chun as it was in the 1850s. You know, these guys who have all the tendon training and the secret chi and the whip and all the secret scrolls and everything or whatever. Yeah. Okay, you're still talking about people in a pre-scientific age uh, who, if you could go back to the 1850s, okay, and meet any of our Wing Chun ancestors from that time, you would most likely find that they were extremely superstitious. Like, oh, wow. Like super, because at that time, like in a pre-scientific era in, 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 in rural China, in, 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 an up, in, a, in a budding town called Fatsan, what do they know about the world outside of Fatsan? They barely know about the other parts of China. Right. Okay? Now, their only exposure are the other martial arts they fight in Fatsan. They've never seen a boxer. It wasn't really boxing the way we know it then anyway. They've never seen someone who could throw a jab cross and go in a single leg take down and tie you into knots on the ground you know <laughs> yes you had chinese wrestling you had try each other wasn't i'm not saying there weren't people going to grab you and throw you and sit on you or whatever but to the level of what we have nowadays with mm -hmm. jujitsu and grappling and sambo and the understanding of striking and how this can integrate with your grappling and the different training methods or whatever you didn't have any of this so it doesn't matter how good those guys were they could have had the thickest most powerful tendons in the world yeah they could have had the secret connected roots so no one can move them or whatever. And I still wouldn't put them for more than 30 seconds against any UFC fighter in their weight class. Damn. All right? Not because they weren't good. You have to look at everyone for their time. Okay? The same way you cannot look at Helio Gracie and say, well, he was, you know, one of the principal founders of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and old school and the guy who really knew it. And if you could go in time and take a prime Helio Gracie and put him in a grappling match versus anyone now in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in his weight class, he would not do very well mm. because Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has improved so much. Um, same thing with many boxers. I think that there are a lot of boxers from older eras who could have done well today, but I do think that if you go back 70 years yeah. um, where the rules were a little bit different and you put those guys in with the new rule set and the new style, they would struggle because it is the, the, these things evolve. Um, fighting, yes, we only have two hands and two feet, as Bruce Lee said, right? Mm -hmm. um, but our knowledge of the best way to use those against different types of fighters in different situations has increased so much yeah. that even if you could make a claim that, oh, all this secret old shit in Wing Chun that would make you so good, it's all been lost. Oh, by the way, uh, but I actually have it. I'm the only guy because I did my research in. in China and I can give you all the stuff that none of the other Wing Chun lineages yeah. have. Okay. Even if you could make a claim that there was a bunch of revealed knowledge that has gone lost and would make you so much better, 
I still don't think that that actually makes you better at fighting against someone with a modern day mixed martial arts skill set. Um, it might make you better against other Wing Chun people in the walled garden of Chi Sao. Oh, you can throw mm -hmm. people around in Chi Sao. Okay, great. That same Wing Chun guy you throw around in Chi Sao, if you just whisper in his ear, uh, don't stick hands with him. Just, just start punching and kicking him at will. You might now suddenly have problems with them because, oh, well, he's not playing my game. And mm -hmm. I learned a couple cool ways to hack and game the system you, with this old school stuff. Oh, uh -huh. but now he's not playing my game. Now I have a problem. And I always he's find it difficult. He's being difficult, right? He's resilient. How come you, do, how come you don't want to stick hands with yeah. me, bro? Because your opponent is under no obligation to stick hands with you. Not at you can all. stay at distance, jab your face off, and kick you in the nuts. He doesn't have to touch <laughs> your hands. So, anyway, back to Topher's question. Oh, yes. Uh, if I had to distill. A Wing Chun, uh, for whatever reason, let's just say zombie apocalypse, uh, I have to train some people. Yeah. Uh, and, now, because we don't is, have a lot of a time. Zombie, uh, yeah. There's, we don't have time like to build up Chi Sao reactions. We don't have time to build up, you know, the kind of the classic Wing Chun base, all right? I think. You got an hour to teach them. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> you can't really teach much in an hour. <laughs> um, I think that I would um, teach the warm up. Mm -hmm. Because the warm up that we do here at City Wing Chun, it's got six it's got parts. Got all the reps. It's got uh, chain punches. Yeah. It's got the straight kick. It's got the side kick to the knee, uh, elbows, knees, and how to get off the floor. Now, in addition to it working as a simple warm up to kind of get your body moving at the beginning of class, it also has the primary tools we have in Wing Chun, right? Our straight punches right up the middle, the straight kick when someone comes at you, right. a side kick to the knee when you're at a different angle, close range tools, elbows, knees, and then if you get knocked on your ass, you need to know how to get back up. That's right. So these are all extremely vital skills. Yeah, it's not everything, it's not all the defenses, it's not all the chi cell, but when you're fighting, you really need to have very sharp primary tools. Your, um, you know, your externally rotated hyun sao going into the tan sao tai jung from the second set of the dummy you know oh, when, when someone gives you a cross-handed lap so it's not, all the time. it's not the most pressing thing when someone's trying to murder your face on sixth avenue right Jeez. there's a there's a a question of what do we need for functional self-defense or fighting or practical fighting and then what is all the stuff in the art and most martial arts if you were to distill them to just what you need to save your ass on the street that would still be a percentage of all of those martial arts. If you took a karate, uh, traditionally trained karate person with all of their karate forms and methods and weapons and everything that they have, and you ask them the same question, yeah, well, they're also just going to take a select few movements, a mm -hmm. couple punches, a couple kicks, maybe a couple close range things. And that would be the primary tools they would need to fight on the street. Yeah. Uh, if we were just preparing ourselves for fighting on the street, we just need to specialize in a couple things and then do a lot of really hard sparring. Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in learning something, you know, as part of a process, a journey, learning something completely, then you learn the entire martial art. But even in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's so much stuff you do with a gi, chokes with the collar and mm -hmm. ways you grab the sleeve and use it, you know, even pulling out the lapel and using that to wrap, like that stuff you're only going to do in gi grappling with another jujitsu person, right? <laughs> if someone attacks you on the street and you're a jujitsu person, what uh -huh. are you going to do? You're going to cover up, you're going to clinch, get them on the ground and do some simple stuff. You're not necessarily going to go for Baron Bolos or De La Hiva guard or any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> like, so th there's oh, yeah. also within the art of Brazilian jujitsu, there's a huge palette of stuff, which is part of the art, and it's necessary for dealing with high-level guys of, within the same style, but that wouldn't necessarily be your toolkit for the street. No. So, you know, even a boxer may not need to use all this stuff. If someone's attacking them on the street, they need a couple really sharp combinations and maybe a clinch or something like that, right? So an argument could be made that if we really just needed something quick and dirty for fighting, any martial art could be could be condensed to a couple elemental bits just for fighting. So that's how I'm going to kind of take this question. That warm-up. So I would say, yeah, we do the, the warm-up, but not just say like, oh, just teach someone the warm-up and be like, okay, you have enough for fighting. Teach them the movements that are in the warm-up. Yeah. The chain punch, the straight kick, the side kick to the knee, the elbows, the knees, and the get up off the ground. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I would teach some clinching tools. Because uh, one thing you learn very quickly, uh, perhaps oh, Vi Viking yeah. Samurai will learn shortly, oh, yeah. is if you cannot put the guy out, all right, you punch the guy a couple times, he's standing there and he returns fire, and you're not able to pa successfully parry or deflect or move out of the way, 
you're going to have to clinch the guy up. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when, when a fight is starting to get out of your control, meaning you're getting pieced up, and the pace is exceeding your ability to kind of control shit, <laughs> then you need a clinch to slow the pace of the fight down to get really close where even if you ate a couple shots, those are not the most damaging shots because you're almost so close. It's, you know, it could be annoying, could feel yeah. a little cheesy on, you know, some of these kind of hits that people do in close range. But that does, but that's what, how you kind of save your ass. You're either all the way out or you're all the way in if you're trying to stay as safe as possible yeah. in a striking match, right? And, and so in addition to the tools of the warm-up, the chain punches, elbows, knees, the kicks, all that kind of stuff, I would teach a couple basic clinch tools, mm. all right? You, you can't put the guy out with your chain punches or your elbows. You're going to have to grab his head, tie up an arm, stick to him, press him, have a couple close-range uh, strikes. So at least you can keep hitting and you can minimize some of the damage, right? Uh, another thing I would emphasize is a distancing sidekick, which is not a typical tactic in Wing Chun. Normally, when we use kicks, um, either kicks in Wing Chun are either meant, uh, whether this is possible to do or not, as a fight ending sequence, yeah. bam, the one really solid, well placed kick to kind of put the cap on. It could be right at the beginning of the fight, could be in the middle of the fight. Uh, whether you can really put someone out with a well placed kick, I mean, we've all seen it happen. It depends on where you hit, if you hit with the right timing, the right power, because you could have everything set up and he moves back a little bit or moves in a little bit. It messes up the timing. That kick's not going to be quite the same. Mm -hmm. But it is possible to have a well-placed kick to certain targets that could be a fight-ending sequence, but it may not be the case. So Wing Chun, usually when we apply kicks, it's either, okay, we're going to end the fight with this well-placed kick to the knee or the gut or whatever, or we're going to use this kick as maybe an entry to get in club. I'm going to kick the person while, uh, while my hands there, are yep. going forward and then, and then use that as a way to close the gap. We don't just, in, in Wing Chun, we don't just kind of kick uh, the way you might see kicking in uh, certain aspects of kickboxing. I don't like, you know, uh, throw a couple low kicks just to see what your reaction is and then throw a couple half kicks to maybe to get you to lower your hand so I can set you up for something up top. Because if we're talking about self-defense... If it's social violence or predatory violence, you don't have two rounds to test. How does he react to my jab? Oh, he's more of a counter fighter. Oh, he's kind of a pressure fighter. Oh, he, you know, uh, when I kick him a couple of times, he switches lead so I can go for the. It's not a sport match where you have tape of this guy that you watch before you fight him. Yeah. And then you have a game plan going in there and then you see how he reacts. You see how your timing is. And then over the course of X number of rounds, you implement your game plan. If it's social violence, oh man, it's the guys in your face. Hey, what are you looking at? He's putting his head on your head. He's pushing you. He's getting in really close. Oh, man. And you have to put up some kind of fence, whether active or passive. You have to either create total space or you have to put your hands in a way where you are covered from sucker punches. You cannot stand in the Wing Chun Chong cell. No, 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 sorry, I don't want to fight or whatever. This close to the guy's going to cream you with a hook. This Ouch. is only for distance, right? So in social violence, you have the option through... Uh, verbal, uh, you know, verbal cues, physical cues, verbal de-escalation to calm the situation down. But at any moment, if the guy's going to move, you're ready to go forward. So in addition to the six uh, basic movements and clinching, I would also teach the fence. Yeah. All right. Get the guy to calm down, having your hands up. It's way better than a traditional martial it's arts fighting stuff. pose, yep. right? Uh, and that is... Uh, uh, you know, to come back to my other point, if it's social violence, you're de-escalating, you're trying to get the guy to calm down, you're trying not to engage, and either the guy backs up and ends up not fighting you, or you got to go in and do it. But either way, there's no, okay, let's touch gloves, and then you're moving around, <laughs> going back and forth, you, you're throwing a couple jabs at him, moving around, saying, okay, you're getting a feeling for his timing and his rhythm, and then over the course of a number of rounds, you're going to be able to implement a game plan. That's not the reality of social violence. Social violence is the dude's in front of you, and he doesn't like you because you looked at him weird, or yeah. maybe, you know, m maybe you provoked it, say, maybe you forgot about Dre. He's like, I didn't forget about Dre. <laughs> yeah, right. And then the guy comes and takes a swing, and then the fight no. is on. There's Don't no pre-fighting monkey dance back and forth, testing the jab, looking at the... You're, you're, you're trying to de-escalate, trying to keep things cool, and either you can avoid the fight or the fight goes on and, 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 and starts suddenly, right? So in social violence, if you have to defend yourself, there is no 
<laughs> jabbing back and forth and timing and back and forth and all that kind of stuff. The other type of violence is predatory violence, and this, which is even worse. Predatory violence, Man. to make it kind of real simple, the, the dude waiting in your closet at home to stab you, <laughs> yeah. all right, okay? There's no, ver the, uh -huh. you, you just, the guy jumps out, rah, yeah. runs, jumps on your bed. Not, right? not like back the usual dude that's waiting in your closet for other things, Dre. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, no, right? yeah, that's a different that, guy. He didn't have a knife or anything. Yeah, yeah something, so, else. So, something else. Yeah. <laughs> so the problem is that, um, you know, uh, in either case, uh, whether we're talking about social violence or predatory violence, the engagement happens really quickly, and it's possible that things don't go your way right from the beginning. Maybe you hesitated a little bit. The guy kind of pushed into you, and he starts moving, and you didn't get your defense off. Right. Okay, that's why a, a backup clinch Struggling is very, with balance very, that, very yep. important, right? So obviously, the punches, the straight kick, the side kick to the knee, the elbows, knees in close range, clinching techniques, uh, the fence for some kind of de-escalation. And uh, those would be, I think, the primary ones. Now, to get back to the other point I was talking about, about kicks, the side kick can also be used to keep distance from someone. That's not a traditional Wing Chun tactic. Traditionally, like I said, the, wing, the kick is done either to put the guy out or to use to bridge the gap to go in, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you could also, if you don't want to engage with someone, uh, this is something they're actually big on in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and Hoist used to actually do it in the very early UFCs, yeah. where you kind of feign that sidekick to the knee to keep distance, right? Because let's say I look at this guy, I don't want anything to do with this guy. You look at this guy and you go, Jesus, on my best no. day, I'll step in and punch this guy as hard yeah. as I can and he'll just go. Pfft. Oh, man. All right? And you go, okay. Uh -huh. I don't want to mess with this guy, all right? Oy, oy. But I need yeah. to get out of here. I need to do something, right? So having the option to kind of maintain your distance by some kind of threatening sidekick while backing away while you're trying to maybe get out of there, recruit some help, that's also a thing. Uh, so I would use something like a distancing mechanism with the side fence, distancing sidekick. Or he might be kick. one of those EPMDs that you just don't want to engage in. You just don't want them touching you at all. EDP. <laughs> oh, EDPs, EDPs. Yes. Did you really just call an EDP an EPMD? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, I... I I guess, yes. Uh, yeah. You don't um, want to engage in this person. Yeah. You just I actually really don't liked want EPMD you. back in the day. Oh, so yeah, EMD, yeah, yeah. It's EMD. Yeah. And EDM. Yeah, but it's an EDM. My yeah. bad. EDM. Yeah, and EDM is, is kind of weird, and you also have to watch out <laughs> because sometimes those guys suffer from DOS effects. <laughs> All right. Das Boot. Das Boot. <laughs> yeah. So, Jesus so that would be So that would be my set list. Yeah. Straight, aggressive punching, a well-placed front kick, a side kick to the knee, mm -hmm. elbows and knees and clinching for close range, getting up off the ground, mm. the fence for protection, mm. and a distancing side kick for distance. So this is right. coming That's out the distillery. That would be the bare minimum. All That's right? your distillery right there. That's my distillery right there. I would probably add... Headlock defense in there too. Yeah, that's Why? Because, yeah, because a headlock is not it's a very so um, common. It's so common. That, that, and a headlock is not a good grappling attack. No, you don't see headlocks in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or in grappling because if you put someone in a headlock, a good grappler will actually use that to take your back because he's behind you. Yeah. can get a leg hook, can get behind you. Suddenly, you got that guy in your back. Yeah. The schoolyard headlock right though is a very, very common thing. Oh man, and it's so common in fighting. It's kind of like nature's clinch. Yeah, it's all right? like the first thing we do. Yeah, you, you may not have kid, learned a proper a fight as a kid. You may not have learned a proper clinching technique from mm -hmm. a martial arts school, but everyone who's been popped in the face <laughs> a couple times as a kid yeah. knows to grab the yeah. other person's head. Um, That's the in, clinch. Yeah, in fact, um, the uh, the guy that I talked about my my seeing in Hong Kong, Robin. All right. The one who wrote the letter about me only having one week of Wing Chun training, right? Not oh, to harp no. on him. Oh, no. But uh, there was an old video of him where he was on stage. And he was supposed to, I don't know, it was supposed to be some kind of friendly challenge. And there's no such thing as a friendly challenge. Who wants to casually and in a friendly way get their ass kicked? No, right? no one. No one, all right? No the, one I know. The whole thing, oh, this is a friendly challenge. What the F is a friendly challenge no, match, okay? No. Uh, and, and so exist. there was something going on, and Robin, who's a very competent Wing Chun person, and didn't want to knock this guy out, or perhaps couldn't if he wanted to, ended up putting his opponent in a headlock, which is not a Wing Chun technique at all. <laughs> but that just shows you that um, if you don't have a lot of fighting experience, mm -hmm. and in terms of doing a more proper clinch technique, um, the headlock is like nature's clinch. 
I yeah. remember you can, sometimes when you see apes going at it at a zoo. Uh-huh. I don't mean going at it in that way. All yeah, right. my yeah, gosh, you, you, you do. Know, no, you know, because that's exactly where his yeah. head goes, right? You'll see that they will um, sometimes put each other in headlocks because yeah. it's the simplest way. I'm going to grab your head and hold you to keep you from punching me, right? Very so, sexy. Did you see that video I sent you? Which one? With the gorillas fighting and someone yells out, get a zookeeper, find the zookeeper. No, I don't remember. And then the zookeeper comes, he's like, I'm a zookeeper, and this is what I would do in this situation. And he shows exactly yes, I have seen play that. by like play, the, play the what play he would do. Is do with the gorillas. It's very beautiful. Funny. Is the dude clowning? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's like, because it, like, it, it's kills like the, the gorillas. He kills the gorillas, and he shows all the headlock defenses and stuff. <laughs> that's so great. I'll find it. Someone sent it to me like five times. <laughs> but it's okay, very yeah, funny. Okay. Suplex yeah, that, is a gorilla. A, I'm surprised I haven't seen that because th- that's always the thing with like. Um, having a big martial arts account on Instagram mm-hmm. is like there'll be something kind of funny in martial yeah. arts, like uh, or something that's going kind of viral. Yeah, and it's a matter of minutes before eighty people send it to me. <laughs> and it and hasn't come across your it's, radar it's yet. It's a matter of one year before my student Thomas will send it to me. <laughs> uh, an old student of mine, Thomas, he helped me with my first book. He's, he sends all the shit. He late. sends me all the stuff that was viral a year ago. He sends it to me like, "Yo, Steve, we check this out." <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I remember seeing yeah. this a year ago when it was a year. I wouldn't be surprised if Thomas next month sends me the bottle cap challenge. <laughs> but I get other people like that who send me stuff like, you know, uh, so th- th- those kind of videos. Uh-huh. Like, you know, it's like, oh, yo, have you yeah. seen this? I'm like, five times today. Uh, yeah. Today. That video, yeah, yeah, I saw it a year ago when it was new. Too good. Uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Too good. Crazy. Well, you got to see it. I sent it to you. Now, quick question. Mm-hmm. Quick answer. If you were in that that mindset like a like a viking samurai okay we're going back to that you wanted you wanted to call someone out Mm -hmm. just for some fame and glory Mm -hmm. who would you call out i'd call you out no 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 No, i'm not famous i'm talking about someone famous can you you imagine for all the frustration (laughs) you've caused our listeners if we had a no no if we had a kfg boxing match we're gonna beat it over okay not 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 wing chun not chiso no no when you know it's no. just like um, just, le- just like uh, Lam Ching Ying's character in Prodigal Sunset. Oh, snap. On the battlefield, oh, there's snap. no father and son. No, All right? oh, snap. I would have a oh, boxing snap. match with you. No, but no, right? KFG, have you noticed yeah. that like each episode towards the end, he always tries to drag something controversial out of you. Like, like yeah, he this does. is just like, Who like does? That? he's trying to Who hang you out that? to dry. Yeah, no, you know? I get Who it. I see it. You see it, right? No. Who would do that? The thing is, I see it. You see it. Oh, yeah. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. And if you have any ideas for a future episode, go ahead and write those in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. One, two, three, bam! Dre yeah. doesn't have the clap because yeah. he's too busy trying to get back with the person that he shouldn't be getting back with. Ooh, put that in the outtakes, please, Andrew. Oh, All, right. All right, you ready? <laughs> you Hello. ready? Nah, motherfucker. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Hey, Dre, your hand is in my screen every time you do that. <laughs> Shake those keys. All right, Dre. That's Lots a- of Viking samurai in tights. <laughs> Lots of... Viking samurais in tights? Yeah. Why? All right, peeps. The f*** was that fart sound? It was a shart. It's shart week. (laughs) What time is it? Okay, I got to get my ass out of here. All right, right, peeps. That wasn't me. Don't look at me. I was about to nail that. That's what she said. (laughs) She had you pegged. Oh, Oh, God. All right, peeps. He doesn't remember what he's supposed to say. He's going to (laughs) start... You're a historian. Can you show me your document? Who said I don't remember that? Uh, I would say about three, two and a half years of history right, inform us on that. <laughs> oh, you're a historian? Yeah, I'm a historian. Can show, can I got the podcast to support the hypothesis that you don't remember shit. All right.
Wow. He was, was even futzing with the words there, and I'm like, oh, he's tripping out. Oh, and he fixed it. Hi. He fixed it. Good job, man. I forgot to say Wing Chun, but you know, it's cool. It's okay. You're a historian. Oh.